Hi, my name is Jason Rios and I'm with Sentient Science. Um, the topic of our discussion today will be around the application of physics-based digital twins for rotorcraft drive systems. Uh, this is a topic that's taking on increased importance in the aerospace community, uh, mainly because drive systems are expected to continue to be major drivers of sustainment costs, even for next generation platforms that are being developed today. So fundamentally, we take a first principles approach to being able to predict the life of mechanical systems. And the reason for that is plain and simple because components break when their materials fail. And while there are some exceptional data science solutions out there that uh, leverage sensor-based solutions and the, and the vast data streams that they collect off of fleet assets, um, you're still limited by being able to detect existing damage. Um, when you start looking at being able to predict the actual initiation point of damage, being able to understand what combination of design factors and material characteristics and usage profiles are going to result in that first crack occurring in that component, well, physics-based solutions clearly uh, offer a lot in that space. Um, and we're a firm believer that uh, by integrating first principles uh, into um, systems like the predictive and prognostic maintenance uh, programs that uh, the USDOD is implementing, for example, will help expand what we refer to as the health awareness horizon of those programs. And the health awareness horizon is, is what we kind of suggest is that longest time frame, the, the furthest you can look out and use predictive solutions to identify potential threats to the health of your assets and, and overall to your fleet. So if this iceberg represents the, you know, the general factors that routinely affect the health of your assets, um, you can see here that we've got you know, a water line that, um, that runs across the graphic that, uh, that kind of identifies that the portions above the water line that are you know, the, the visible portions of the iceberg um, are only a small portion of the total amount of factors that need to be considered. Because there's a lot of, a lot of important um, considerations that are occurring below that water line. And if we suggest that this water line kind of represents the limits of sensor detection, then those factors that are above it, the visible parts of the iceberg, um, we can call them the detectable faults, right? And there are, like I mentioned, there are some exceptional data science solutions out there that are very capable of identifying these detectable faults based on uh, sensor inputs. Um, there are exceptional um, machine learning algorithms that can process that data. Uh, but you know, generally speaking, the sensor limitations, um, uh, you know, kind of limit the advance notice uh, that maintainers will get for those faults up to maybe about four months, let's say, uh, which is, it's great, it's valuable. But when you think about uh, how long it takes to replace or to, to place an order and get a, uh, uh, a component in to say replace a, um, a main transmission, uh, four months is, is simply not enough lead time. Um, and there are ways to train um, data science solutions to look beyond you know, this, this limit of sensor detection um, by using usage-based health estimates uh, but that requires a lot of data and it's very expensive uh, because, you know, really actual failure data for drive systems is, is pretty sparse out in the field for existing systems. And it, it could even be non-existent for, for brand new designs. So, you know, what's the alternative? Well, you know, we would suggest that the physics-based approach um, can be used to kind of simulate the entire spectrum of loading conditions and allow you to look um, far beyond the timeframes that those uh, sensor-based solutions are, are capable of. Um, you know, we've had success 
uh, identifying um, faults uh, 12 to 18 months out uh, in some of our other applications. Um, and, and those are what we're kind of classifying as emerging defects. Those are um, faults that have not yet manifested themselves. The cracks have not yet started to, to occur, but we can recognize using the capabilities that are here in, the, in this white box um, uh, of the physics-based approach uh, to be able to um, use those analytical capabilities to be able to predict how the loading conditions are going to eventually result in an accumulation of stresses that will eventually cause um, the material components to break down. So, but if we want to look a little deeper than that, you know, kind of look beyond just the when of when um, a fault might occur, um, we, we want to start looking at, at the how, right? What are the failure modes that we can expect our asset to start to experience based on certain loading conditions or design characteristics, et cetera? Um, and, and how do we expect those to manifest themselves? And then if we want to even go a level deeper than that, we want to get to the point that we can understand why will that start occurring? What's the underlying root cause? Is it a design issue? Is it the way the components are being manufactured? Is it um, that the tolerances are not uh, tight enough in certain you know, manufacturing uh, uh, processes? You know, what is it? Is it, how the, is it how the asset is being used? You know, in the case of, a, of an aircraft, is the aircraft typically being flown uh, beyond the, the uh, operational loads that were expected by the OEM when they designed the aircraft and set the life expectancies for those components? So an effective physics-based solution can really unlock a vast collection of additional insights that really allow you to explore the entire design space uh, for your drive system components. And you can use that to be able to predict future outcomes. So for example, if you want to, to look at an existing or fielded asset with a certain transmission design, um, is it worthwhile to consider changing the lubricant that's being used um, in that uh, transmission? Um, is it um, cost effective to consider maybe replacing some of those critical gears with different gears made of different base materials or applying super finish to those critical gears in order to change the surface roughness profile? All of those things can have potentially significant life impacts on that design. And the power of the physics-based solutions is it allows you to explore all of those potential trade-offs uh, in a virtual environment uh, before you, you proceed down the path of investing in any of those uh, particular um, improvements. Um, this also uh, actually enables significant opportunities when you're looking at, uh, for example, um, uh, new design programs to see cost, schedule, and reliability improvements. And those are the things that the aerospace community has long used to justify investment in digitalization. So our digital clone solution represents sentience effort to democratize this technology and make it available to the entire aerospace community and to try to achieve those um, long sought after benefits that were the whole um, genesis for this community's support of the digital twin concepts. So, our solution is the product of nearly $23 million in CIVR funding and uh, $30 million in private equity. And we've taken that and we've leveraged our core technology to create our dual use uh, digital clone solution. So starting with our 2014 selection as a Tibbetts Award winner for our work in advanced rotorcraft development programs with DOD, we've successfully commercialized our solution in both aerospace and wind energy, and we're awarded a patent for our approach in 2019. So at a high level, 
What Digital Clone does is it enables our users to reproduce the type of detailed analysis that our scientists have been doing for years as part of our engineering services efforts with uh, a variety of government agencies and also with some private partners um, and package it in an easy to use software solution that enables things like system level modeling, um, the type of bearing dynamic analysis that rivals the capabilities um, that are of, of the tools that are being used by the bearing manufacturers themselves, uh, detailed gear stress analysis, and really what makes the whole solution really special is our proprietary component life prediction capability. So once we have all this stuff modeled, we have the capability of simulating the operational loads that um, are being applied to that system and being able to predict the, the life outcomes of those kinds of operations. So let's take a little bit of a, of a detailed look at our patented process. Um, it, it starts with kind of a high level model, a multi-body dynamics uh, model of in, in this particular instance, uh, you know, it's a gearbox, right? Um, we build that virtual model, we apply the loads to it, and we use that to identify those critical components, those gears, those bearings, whatever they are, that are going to ultimately drive the life of that gearbox. Um, from there, we do a dynamic analysis of the critical, you know, gears and bearings, and we identify what we call the material hotspots, uh, those critical loading areas within each of those components that are um, the areas that we're going to perform our deep dive material analysis into. So the next step is uh, we take uh, material samples of those critical gears and bearings at those hotspot locations, and we characterize those materials. Uh, we measure um, the surface roughness and, and a wide variety of other uh, characteristics of those materials. And we use all of that um, in, in the next step where we create a, a representative volume element that reflects all of those characteristics of those materials. And we use that as the basis uh, for our um, simulations going forward. Um, we have a proprietary mixed DHL uh, solver and traction model that uh, allows us to uh, account for the um, the surface to surface interactions, even you know with with the effectiveness of of the lubricant layer being accounted for, to be able to identify those micro asperities uh, and those those other uh, aspects of the surface roughness that might lead to stress risers or otherwise have an impact on the uh, the life of the component. <coughs> Excuse me. So once we have all of that, then what we do is we apply the stresses um, uh, at the microstructure level to that representative volume element and account for the, the, the tractions and, and the other boundary conditions. And we allow the simulation to use the, the damage mechanics models to tell us what the, uh, the outcomes are of the mechanical failures. Um, we do not predefine um, or, or seed uh, the faults themselves. We do not identify in advance where we want the crack to start um, or where the, the first pit is going to occur. What we do is we apply it to the uh, representative volume element and we allow the simulation to, um, to define where that failure is going to start occurring. And what that represents at this part of the process is a single data point. And think of it um, as you would a, uh, a, single, um, a single run to failure on a fatigue life test, right? And that, that in and of itself is, is valuable, but that does not necessarily help you draw conclusions about what an entire population might look like. Um, so to be able to account for all of that randomness, both in the materials and the uncertainty, related to the combination of materials and loading conditions, et cetera, um, the solution allows you to rerun the simulation multiple times. And um, in each of those, a, a randomly generated microstructure will be, will be added in, along with some other characteristics that change the, um, 
change in, uh, you know, within the boundaries of uh, the design and, and manufacturing um, uh, criteria, uh, kind of change it slightly so that you get, it's like you're testing a different component, each a, a different physical component each time, even though it's the same basic design built to the same manufacturing tolerances and design characteristics. And what you end up with is a the ability to create a virtual population of failures um, that are similar to running, you know, 30 physical tests, or, you know, uh, you know, sometimes we have customers that want to do 100 or 200, uh, because they want more data. Uh, but what it does is it allows you to computationally create those data points in a very representative environment, in a way that's a lot more cost effective and a lot more, um, more schedule friendly. Um, than it would be if you were going to uh, to try to run a bunch of physical components to failure. So while our process itself can be very complex and, and includes a very comprehensive analysis, our team has worked tirelessly to ensure that the digital clone interface is intuitive and easy to learn. And we've done that because what we want is we want to enable um, all engineers, even those without a specific background in physics or material science, to be able to create these models using the same types of solutions that they become accustomed to in other, in other um, uh, disciplines. So it enables you to do system modeling, uh, to be able to model kind of at the gearbox level and, and, and you know, apply the loads. Uh, but then it also has built in apps um, that walk the user through the creation of very detailed gear and bearing um, models at the component level. And then, you know, we, we've kind of talked on the previous slide about the importance of kind of the component life prediction module. And that's where um, the, the models that are created and the loads that, that are, are, uh, are defined are run in a simulated environment in, an, in a high performance computing environment to be able to predict the life outcomes that are generated by that combination of design materials and loading conditions. So our vision for how these models support a predictive and prognostic maintenance environment includes the establishment, <coughs> excuse me, of a baseline model. Uh, and that baseline model reflects the, the aircraft drive system design, the fundamental design that we would expect all aircraft in the fleet of that same type to be, to be uh, built against. Um, and that kind of serves as the, as the core model. Um, then what we do is connect that model to the data streams that are available at the fleet and enterprise level. And that allows us to enable asset specific models. But the idea being that at the beginning, all of the assets would start from a common initial point. But then over time, the outputs of those models start to diverge as each individual asset creates its own unique usage and maintenance history. So we're able to take into account things like the replacement of components, certain maintenance events, flight profiles, or anything else that would have a meaningful impact on the health risk associated with those key drive system components. So to support this vision, we've created an entire ecosystem that creates or that features, excuse me, <coughs> a multi-system framework, a multi-scale framework um, to assess the life impacts from the most basic material level where the physics-based models tend to be more predominant uh, up to the enterprise level where we're able to leverage um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to help train the models with inputs from the vast data streams that are being collected across the fleet. And so to be able to do that in an integrated comprehensive environment is uh, why we created the digital clone multi-scale framework. And that is um, what we wanted to discuss with you today. We wanted to make sure that, uh, that this um, community was aware of uh, what's available out there when it comes to 
um, physics-based models and how they can be used um, effectively to supplement uh, some of the existing systems that are already part of a predictive and prognostics maintenance environment. So uh, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, please, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. And um, we also have uh, a virtual booth here at the, uh, at the IMH event uh, that has plenty of uh, technical content. It's got white papers, it's got videos, and we encourage you to explore that uh, to learn more about uh, what our technology has to offer. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, thank you.